Okay, good morning. Uh, this is Dr. Garayas, MED 260, uh, which is exams and specialty procedures. This is the addenda lecture on the stuff that we weren't able to talk about in uh, the Zoom session that we just had. So this week's topic is uh, history taking, preparing the exam room, and um, if you recall, if you were in my uh, medical terminology class, in order, the, the process that we go through, you know, to uh, medically manage our patient and looks like soap notes. S O A P. Why am I doing this? I should be hitting up right the notes. Uh, let's talk about he history taking notes. We'll talk about um, uh, the preparing the exam room shortly. But uh, kindly ignore these page numbers because they're not, um, they're not accurate. It may be the same chapter, patient interview in history, chapter 36 in your textbook. That's right here, red shell E textbook right here. But uh, it's an older version, so the, the page numbers don't match. And silly me, I'm too lazy to go fix them. I will though, eventually. So there's a case in the beginning. And uh, let's look at that case while, while we're here. Now, again, yet another new version of your, uh, your textbook. So, um, medical assisting, is this it? Ministry, administrative and clinical procedures. Let's look at this textbook. Start reading. Is this the textbook I want? I'm going to go up here to the table of contents. And uh, it was like, uh, if you open up this, this little arrow, chapter 36, patient interview and history. And we have here Mr. Peter Smith. He's a male patient, uh, retired Caucasian, over seven, goes over 70. So in real life, we'd have not only his actual age, let's say 72, um, we also talk about, um, you know, is he Caucasian, is he African American? Uh, not because we're racist, but data, and that's what my uh, lecturer was talking about. We look at patients like uh, uh, data, like what, uh, what information can we derive from it? Because people of Asian descent will have a certain uh, uh, set of pathologies that are most likely with them. For example, um, second and third generation Japanese um, patients, if they have a stomach ache, I'm almost thinking of uh, cancer. But if the patient's Caucasian, I'm not thinking about cancer. Um, um, a Caucasian patient greater than uh, age 45, I'm thinking of prostate, prostate issues, potentially prostate, uh, um, uh, prostatic CA, or um, BPH. So it's important to know also their job. Like, is he retired? That means he's got nothing to do with sedentary lifestyle. Or does he do volunteering? Or does he do some uh, work part-time? Because remember, based on what kind of occupation you have, there'll be different things. For, for example, uh, a police officer who, um, you know, who walks the neighborhood they'll have a certain set of pathologies versus me who sits, the, sits here at a computer uh, talking to a computer all day, okay? So Peter Smith, the male retired Caucasian, 72 years of age with a history of mild, um, and we don't say call it mild, we usually state that it's controlled, type two diabetes, and he scheduled appointment. He states that he is feeling anxious and fatigued and having difficulty eating and sleeping. So that, is his chief complaint, okay? From his own words. I don't write the words anxiety, 
or what they call term malaise, which is fatigue. I don't say dyspnea and I don't say insomnia. That's the, the language of medicine that we use. We want for the chief complaint, the, the, the language of what the patient said. So he arrived in the clinic with his wife. During the patient interview, he states that he wakes up in the middle of the night, almost nightly. He also has many nights. Again, greater than age 45, I'm thinking maybe he has to get up to pee or maybe he wet himself. Uh, that's common, right? Caucasian male, greater than 45 years of age. So you could see how patient data or patient demographics tells me things. He also has uh, no known allergies, NKA, right? But of course, I always ask. He also has many nights when he can't even fall asleep. In addition, he's lost eight pounds in the last month. Now, even if he's working out of the gym, running five miles a day, you shouldn't lose more than 1.2 pounds per week, right? Uh, anything greater than that is, uh, is, is non-physiologic. And also anything greater than that, that means your diet is too hardcore and your workouts are too hardcore. You will gain all of that weight back. And we kind of talked about that in anatomy and physiology. Eight pounds in two months, that's no bueno. So something's going on, maybe he's not eating. Then he stated, all of this started six months ago upon the death of his son. So Mr. Smith could be in bereavement. The bereavement is, uh, uh, is they, uh, the patient's gonna have all the signs and symptoms of major depressive disorder, but for a year after the death of a significant uh, other or a significant loved one. And of course it's his son, right? And remember, I don't know who said it, but I believe it's Hemingway. Don't quote me on it. Uh, it is the, one of the greatest sins in the world for a parent to bury a child. Um, my wife and I were actually just talking about that last night on how devastating it would be if one of us died, but how much more devastating it would be if one of the kids died. I know, very morbid stuff. But in the clinical realm, these things we need to know, right? Remember the holistic view of our patient. We need to know uh, everything about our patient as a whole. Now, the rest of the chapter, you have the goals and, and, and everything. And my notes are based on this chapter. I just wanted to go over uh, that, uh, that case with you because you will be uh, responsible for that case for your midterm exam. Remember, midterm exam is 50 items, multiple choice. It will be done via online. We'll have instructions for that. And, uh, and if you had my class before, it will be done in the same way. But notes are typically broken up to, clinical notes are pretty much broken up and they're called SOAP notes, S-O-A-P. So S is the subjective. That's our uh, subject, our patient, okay? So chief complaint, what's the main reason they're here? History of present illness, we need the chronicle, uh, chronicle, chronological story of how the patient got to where they got to to the point where they had to come in for medical consultation. But the HPI only deals with items, um, only with the chief complaint items. Now, past medical history, okay? Uh, any previous surgeries, hospital admissions, or illnesses? Oh, that's that student calling. Okay, after my lecture, please. Family history. Now, we only want to deal with the immediate family, the father, mother, brother, or sister. Social history, everything that you do at a party. Well, at least what I used to do as a party. Uh, drinking, smoking, illegal, dr uh, illegal drug use, and uh, sexual orientation and sexual practices. Remember we talked about the review of systems. That's the only time we have closed questioning, and closed questioning is yes or no questions. So let's go find that ROS. And it said it was on here in the chapter. Oh. Here are some wonderful effective me uh, methods. This is lovely stuff right here on page 747 of your online text, table 36-1, right? Good ways, effective ways, mirroring, verbalizing. Make sure you make the patient say it. Make sure you make the patient repeat it back to you. Like if the patient said, I got dizzy, then I fell. So I would always mirror it back. So you always feel dizzy, then did the dizziness cause the fall? And I always mirror it and put it back on them just for clarification. And again, clarification, reflection, right? Um, 
I would ask on that patient that's, uh, that I mirrored, I would, uh, I would ask him and her, and it goes, uh, do you always get dizzy before you fall? Um, all the dizzy spells that you have, um, does it always end up in falling? So it forces the patient to reflect. Now we can't, we shouldn't ask on an interview, uh, leading questions, close-ended questions. You do not challenge the patient. Do not, do not actively probe. Don't push. If the patient doesn't want to say something to you, then don't. Do not agree or disagree. You are a tape recorder. You write down patient claims. So if the patient says, he goes, Adolf Hitler is still alive and he's the guy controlling the aliens and that's why I'm in the office. That's what you have to write down. Yes. And that's actually a quote. I had a, I had a patient. She, uh, she's from South America. And she said that Adolf, she met Adolf Hitler. She worked for Adolf Hitler and uh, that he was controlling some sort of the aliens. Now, any signs and symptoms that you see, don't say that even if you're a doctor, you don't say patient has depression. I believe the patient is a substance abuser. Just write down the things that you see that may, that may lead you to suspect depression. Like for this gentleman right here, um, Mr. Smith, right? I will start writing down all the things. And then of course, if I suspect depression, I'm gonna get him to the psychiatrist. If I suspect uh, substance abuse, I'm going to get the toxicology blood test, okay? All right, so these are the things that uh, you have to look at. I'm trying to find a review of systems. View of systems. Okay, let's just Google it so you know what an ROS. So what does a review of systems look like? It looks like this. And if you've seen this before in the doctor's office, the medical assistant or the nurse, ugh, trying to sign me up. I just want to see, okay, let's look at this. Hello, please work for me, internet. Mm. Come on, it's HTML, it should be fast. All righty. Here's another one that looks like an ROS. Here's an ROS. Or heck, let me just... Okay, maybe you guys could see this this way. Or what I always do, silly me, I can do this. Okay, oh, here it is. Wait. So this is how you do a uh, 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 review of systems. It's the only time in the history where you have a closed-ended uh, question. Yes or no? Excuse me, Mr. Smith. Um, have you ever used tobacco? He goes, and he goes, well, back when I'm, Mr. Smith, yes or no, please, for the following questions. Yes. I goes, or, or do you consider yourself a former smoker? Yes. Have you had your flu immunizations this year, Mr. Smith? No. Have you had pneumonia vaccine this year? No. Uh, during the past couple of weeks uh, leading up to this exam, uh, have you had a fever? Well, I don't feel, yes or no, Mr. Smith. That's what you have to do for the whole entire thing. Now, the review of systems is to catch anything extra that may or may not be related to the uh, chief complaint and the history of present illness. And that's what an ROS is. Okay, let's go back to our notes. There's bullet points and the patient's rights. Go through those uh, uh, patient rights that were in the beginning of the chapter. Interviewing skills that, uh, Chapter 36-1, they had the effective ones, which were effective, which were, um, which were not effective, right? Look out for nonverbal cues like guard, guarding. Guarding is when, um, you know, when you touch somebody or you attempt to touch the person and then they like put their hands up or they kind of wince away from you. Grimacing is, you know, uh, you make that face, you know, you frown. So you could be touching somebody and you ask them, how's that feel? And they're like, okay, but then they, they make a face like something smells. 
and that's and it's and it's mild and it's you know they make that face and they make it for a brief moment so you press in on the affected area again and they do that same face and that's called grimacing or they have lack or excessive eye contact uh, like for example you're preparing something and they're staring right at the thing you're preparing so that will that will make that will give me a clue that my patient's nervous and my patient's concerned about the procedure that's about to happen. So if you're in my phlebotomy class or we're going over phlebotomy, I'll show you don't prepare in front of them or uh, be in front of the patient so they don't have direct view of, you know, when you prepare the needles. Have a broad knowledge base. That's why, of course, you go to school. You have to see the bigger picture. And what's the bigger picture? You are there to help the patient. So being, you know, Know that, yes, you're the low person among the totem pole, but you're also, what would happen to the totem pole if I cut out the low person on the totem pole? It would fall down. So you are a vital, important part of this medical management. Read the chart before going in. Remember to gain consent. Hi, good morning, Mr. Smith. My name is, Nel My name is Nelson. I'm your medical assistant this morning. Is it okay if I talk to you and ask you a couple of questions? It's for the doctor so that um, the doctor can uh, prepare your management better, right? And beware of sensitive topics, especially an older person. Do you think he's going to want to talk about his penis? Of course not, right? So uh, be tactful, okay? Right? Don't ask him things like, you know, he's 70 years old. You, uh, give some little, uh, little respect. You don't ask him questions like, hey, do you get it up anymore? Uh, do you still bang the missus? Can't say things like that. You know, like, um... Mr. Smith, I'm going to ask you some sensitive questions, and so so please stop me if if you feel uncomfortable. Don't feel like answering me, but it's for it's highly confidential, and it'll be only shared with the a physician. Um, have you had any um, bouts of erectile dysfunction? Oh, you don't know what that means. It means like you know, uh, um, uh, did you have? Are you having trouble um, uh, getting or maintaining an erection? Do you see how you can talk that way? Look at the six C's of charting. Let's look at that. Again, we already mentioned, it must be in the client's words. It should be clear. So if it's unclear of what the patient is saying to you, right, you get clarity, you mirror the patient and you ask the patient for more information. It has to be complete. All, when you fill out a medical form, you have to also address all the blank spots. So if there's a blank spot, uh, a blank on a medical form, and it's not applicable to the patient, write the words not, ap not applicable or N slash A. For example, there will be some uh, menstrual questions on the history form. Um, do you think I'm going to ask Mr. Smith when's the last time, when's his last menstrual period? Of course not. So that'll be what? N A, so N slash A. Okay. Concise. Uh, don't write a novel. Uh, how many times I've had on the, on the history? Uh, let me tell you in my great vast experience, blah, 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 right? I don't need to know all that. I only need to know only the things germane to my patient's illness. That's it. I don't need to know the back. I, need, I don't need to know the entire backstory. Make sure it's in chronological order or what is known as reverse chronological order. So every, you always start with the first experience of our patient's symptoms. So when we talk about Mr. Smith, um, uh, we, we talk about six months prior to consultation, Mr. Smith's son, uh, uh, son died in an auto accident. Um, from that point onward, Mr. Smith has been uh, having uh, progressive bouts of insomnia, um, lasting one to two times per week, and it has, uh, has progressed. He has lost eight pounds. Do you see how we're going back in time and then catching ourselves up? And that's reverse chronological order. And again, we also mentioned this as well, confidentiality. The content of the patient's chart is not the patient's property. It is the property of the facility. It's not your property as the clinician. It's not the property of the patient. So if the patient wants a copy, uh, um, if you're in my um, medical law and ethics class, you will know that the patient must have written authorization and permission, right, from the facility, not necessarily the doctor, from the facility. And we, as the facility, can charge them because that takes office hours and office time. Um, back in my day, it was like, 
fifteen dollars per page, something like that, and all pro all processing should be done within five business days, something. But every office is different. But but that is a big time question on your um, uh, your um, medical assistant registry exam is. Uh, um, can the patient just grab the chart? Can the patient just make any copies that they want? Nope, they cannot. Because the ownership and the responsibility to uphold HIPAA, right? Health Information uh, Portability and Accountability Act. And um, it is the responsibility of the facility to keep your stuff private. And um, yeah, now I'm yapping too much. So let's go to back to the notes. What else do you need to know? Typical contents also applies to EMR. We went through SOAP. Be able to read laboratories, okay? And um, you should know uh, uh, PQRST and uh, it's a different way of looking at a patient and um, how to deal with the patient uh, in pain and the abbreviations as well. So now that I stated all that, I close this. And now we can uh, look at the different things that I just mentioned. So what's important regarding lab results? You must know how to read abnormals. So here, I know this is abnormal because it's not only colored in red, I look over here to the reference ranges and it's above. And me, um, my, my doctors, used to like it when I used to take a um, um, highlighter and I just highlight all the abnormals or even the high normals. I used to uh, highlight, them, uh, highlight them as well, okay? And you need to get that to the physician because, and what I like doing is I flag it. So electronically you can flag it, but if you're still in a paper um, office, I like sticking the lab report out sideways and uh, in the chart so that the doctor can see it. So when I look at this, right, this is your uh, BMP or basic metabolic profile. I look at the patient, I make sure it all matches. So I would tell Dr. Whalen about nothing looks abnormal. So one of the things I could ask my doctor is, um, hey, Dr. Whalen, um, the BMP came back for Shana Jones. Would you like to talk to her or would you like me just to email her, tell her that um, everything's normal? Nine times out of 10, the doctor still would want to talk to them, okay? This is the old way that they used to use notes, S-O-A-P. Now, going back to our notes, what's the O? It's the objective. So that's any physical examination and any lab, lab reports. What's A or the assessment? That's the diagnosis, the official diagnosis. So if the biller has to go bill something, that's where the biller would look. They'd look in the ass assessment or the A portion. And P, what's the plan? Are we gonna admit? Are we going to talk to another doctor? We're we gonna do surgery? And that's the plan. Other ways of looking at SOAP notes is SOMR, and that's source-oriented medical records. Now it's arranged by where the data is coming from. So that's SOMR. POMR is also a method done uh, uh, by hospitals and larger clinics. Is the, it's what they call problem-based, right? So they have a database, which is of course patient history, lab results, and whatnot, right? Then they have the problem list. And just like this diagnosis up here in SOAP notes, the diagnosis and the problem list is numbered one, two, three, four, five, or whatever, how many problems they have and whatever diagnostic diagnosis, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, what, how many diagnoses they have. And whatever is on the top of the list is the most pertinent. Whatever is the bottom part of the list is not, I'm not paying attention to as much. So for Mr. Smith, I if I do a POMR on him, I would be concerned of, uh, about um, to rule out RO um, uh, insomnia, right? Causes of insomnia. So he would have to see neurology. I also am thinking of potential uh, beginnings of major depressive disorder, but since it's only been six months, may or may not want to talk to psychiatry. And those are my two biggest problems. 
does um, uh, uh, history of hypertension or is it diabetes? Is that on his problem list? Yes, but it's further down because it's controlled. I'm, I don't have issue with it. So the problem list and the diagnostic plan should be in that order, okay? And then lastly, they have progress notes. Now, one of the main questions that you'll get on a uh, medical assistant registry examination is that they, uh, they always ask, what is the function of medical notes? The function of medical notes is to show continuity of care. Yes, it's to uh, you know, document and everything. Yes, it's to also inform the doctor and inform the patient. It's used as a form of communication. But the number one reason for your exams is to prove legally continuity of care. Because if I don't continue care, that is called abandonment. And that is a problemo because my patient can sue. And that's, the, that's part of the reason why your doctor always calls you for your follow-up visits. Because I have to document that we talked about things, even if those things are um, normal results. Okay? Now, JCO or the Joint Commission, right? JCO is the Joint Commission on Hospital, Accredita uh, Hospital Accreditation Associations, right? They deal with the processes on how we do business in a hospital or uh, anywhere that there's healthcare, uh, anywhere that there's touching patients. Now, they have a lot of issues with common medical abbreviations. The problem is we still use common medical abbreviations uh, in everything. So you got to know the common uh, abbreviations, and that's a continuation of medical terminology. So I'm not going to go over uh, uh, um, these things. Uh, you should know these things, right? Like they don't like L and R. Um, L used to be, L, left used to be L with a circle around it. R used to be R with a circle around it. Nowadays, there's drop-down menus on electronic medical records. So if you're typing stuff out and um, my patient is awake and oriented within three spheres, the, the second I start writing A, to A and O, there will be a drop down menu and uh, you click on it and it will write the whole entire thing, awake and oriented within three spheres. And the three spheres are, if you recall, maybe if you guys didn't have me for another lecture, the three spheres, this is the reason why the doctor asks, hey, you know who I am? That's the sphere of knowing the person. Hey, you know what year it is? That's time. Hey, do you know where you are? And that's place. And if you're oriented within three spheres, time, person, and place, you good. You probably have good frontal lobe uh, activity. And also parietal stuff as well. Parietal and, yeah, why did I say frontal lobe? It could be a whole bunch of places. But if the patient asks, it's 2016 and it's the war of the machines, well, then you know something's up. Okay, doc, I know it's you and I know I'm in Inova. Uh, but uh, I seriously believe we're living in 2016, and that's a problem. PQRST, that is the, uh, uh, what's it called? It's not called an anagram. It's called the um, acronym for how you ask a patient regarding pain. Now, pain is highly subjective, okay? Everything that comes out of your patient's mouth is highly subjective, meaning to say is it could be exaggerated, it could be downplayed, we don't know because what hurts for me may not hurt for you. So we uh, in the clinical world have PQRST to define the patient's pain a little bit better. So if my patient was complaining of a tummy ache, I would ask, hey, tummy ache, uh, is there anything you do to make, to make it worse? Or what do you do to make it better? And that's provoke or provocation or palliative. That's P. Q, quality and or quantity. How many times during a day do you get this pain? And what kind of pain? Is it dull, like if somebody punched you? Or is it like a knife, like somebody stabbed you? Region or radiation? Can you point to me where exactly it is? And that pain, does it stay there or does it move around? And can you also point to me where it moves around? Severity scale. On a scale from one to 10, 10 being the most horrific pain in your life, one being annoying, what is it? And your new patient will tell you. And of course, the timing, again, related to quality and quantity. Hey, when does this happen? You know, when you get your stomach ache, does it happen before meals or after meals, right? In the mornings or does it happen at night? So 
that's PQRST. Okay. You know these other abbreviations? Nice to know. The other one's better. Polypharmacy, write down all medications. Okay. And have your patient have a list. Oh, here it is. Here's a nice, beautiful example of ROS. It's on page 757 and a nice uh, um, uh, uh, history. And remember, if it doesn't pertain to your patient, right, you, you have to write something down to acknowledge that, um, that. So if we went through this patient, right? Mr. Smith, you have any gout? Uh, uh, or this is a um, uh, blood relative, um, does not know or none, 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 not applicable, none, none, if, if there are any of their family members. And that's the, um, that's the family history. And you see, I only need to know about immediate people. I don't need to know about your second, second cousin twice removed, right? Any hospitalizations, right? Health habits, which is uh, social history, occupational concerns. Because remember, if he's a cop that has stress and whatever, or if he's like me, like a teacher, you think what? Not as much stress, but a sedentary lifestyle, okay? Here's another PQRSD, which is nice to look at, and what kind of questions you could ask. Chief complaint, we went over that, went over that. Family history, we went over that. Here's the pain scale, and maybe you've seen this in a chart, right? And if the patient, you know, like, hey, look at it, you know, circle the one you feel best describes your pain. And remember, that's highly subjective. Okay, um, take a good look at these procedures at the end. Um, and remember, I said, focus on how do you deal with a potentially violent patient or angry patient? How do you deal with a nervous patient, right? How do you deal with kids and their... Um, um, their guardians. Oh, here's a beautiful thing, especially if you missed, uh, uh, you missed my lecture, I'll ask. Go and finish the exam preparation questions in the back. Shoot me, uh, shoot me an email uh, and, um, uh, with confirmed answers, and that will be uh, your, um, your lesson grade. As I stated in the uh, lecture earlier, the way you get um, the, the way you get attendance and the way you get um, graded for your, the lesson for the week is if you showed up to lecture. And that's the, um, and if you can't show up to lecture, you're gonna need to do one of these. And it's just one through 10. And then you, uh, you know, copy and paste it and then email me the correct answers. Alrighty. So that is, let's go back to the course. That is uh, history taking and notes. Now preparing the examination room, that's a really quick thing. Okay, but the main thing, and let's look at chapter nine. My text. So we could make sure that um, we're in the right chapter. Let me close this out, look this up. Table of contents, safety environment, chapter nine, right here. Okay, kindly read through this. Let's go over the case just to make sure because you're responsible for all cases in every chapter that we talked about. Let's talk about Miss Jones, a graduate student. She came to the office with a swelling and a red pustule on her face. She states that the problem uh, started two days prior to uh, consultation with a small pimple near her nose. It became irritated and extremely swollen and painful overnight. And you see how it's reverse chronological. This morning, she noticed yellow drainage and the legion site and the swelling was increased. The area of drainage is approximately one centimeter in diameter, her upper lip and the side of her face. So progression of her symptoms got worse, which prompted con today's consultation. She has allergy to peanuts and cinnamon. That's important. And um, uh, these are the things that we want to go do for her because it's obvious now she has an uh, infection on her face, 
right? So we want to see, is it carcinoma or is it uh, multi-resistant Staphylococcus aureus because it's on her skin? We're thinking about most common, okay? So that's the case. I could ask you, what was the chief complaint? The swelling on her face, right? Uh, and the progression of it. Uh, what, was the, what was the diagnosis? Now, differential diagnosis is not the actual diagnosis. It's not the actual assessment. Differential diagnosis is the things that the physician is thinking about. So Dr. Williams is thinking about carcinoma and she's thinking about MRSA, right? And for uh, African-American patient, I'm not thinking too much skin cancer because she has a lot of melanin, which is, has a UV protection function, but pus and pimple, it's on her face. We have tons of Staphylococcus aureus uh, on our skin. So it probably uh, infected uh, pimple or even uh, it could mean something worse, but we're going to look into it. So let's look at the notes. Let's see what's important with and read it on how to prepare the room. It's a lot of it's common sense, but I'd like to talk about this. The levels of asepsis, which is a big, big topic for your registry exam and also for this class. There are three levels and it starts at sanitization, then it goes a higher level, disinfection, then the highest level of asepsis is sterilization. The function of asepsis is to reduce the amount of potential pathogens. You could never get rid of them all, but you can get rid of most of them so that um, um, we don't spread anything in our facility or when the patient goes out into the world. So sanitization is the lowest level. So that's scrubbing. We do it with neutral pH solutions like soap and water. Um, uh, um, make sure to separate equipment into categories, sharps with non-sharps, hemostats with hemostats. We'll show you that in lab. And in order to get to the sterilization process, we have to start with the sanitization process. Then after the sanitization process, and there's certain things that we only sanitize, like your uh, stethoscope. I do not put it in a disinfectant, nor do I sterilize your stethoscope. You'll ruin it, right? But I scrub it down and I use a neutral pH solution, like 70% isopropyl alcohol. End of list, I move on with my day. Same thing with my PPE, my goggles. I do not disinfect it. I do not get into the, the sterilization level. Now, disinfection calls for antiseptics and disinfectants, and there's a whole list of them, and I'll go over them momentarily, and you need to know them. So you need to know which product gets used to be on what instrument. And let's go, let's find where that is. Furnishing, all that stuff, ultrasound cleaning, you can get through that. Here you go. These are all the disinfectants, okay? And I did mention 70% isopropyl alcohol, but that is the worst that you can do. And germicidal soap products, that's called soap, okay? But if you just have it in normal water, but the, the disinfectants that I'm really talking about, stuff like chlorine, bleach, formaldehyde, Cydex, which is glutaraldehyde, hydrogen peroxide, iodine, providine iodine, right? And phenol, uh, which is uh, um, carbolic acid. This is the stuff that you need to know where we use it and you need to know this chart, okay? Because this is important because you need to know what you use things on. For example, glutaraldehyde, respiratory equipment, okay? Uh, formald formaldehyde, any specimen that's either once living or once dead. So anything that goes to pathology has to be packed in formaldehyde, okay? All of this stuff is no bueno for your skin or your mucosal lining, or your eyes. So when you're dealing with any of this stuff, you not only have to glove up, mask up, face shield, and or goggles, okay? And this uh, chart can be found, table 9-1, page 186, okay? Where am I, where am I? All righty. So, sterilization, that's autoclave. This is a lovely both A and B question. Autoclave could use pressure or it could use heat or both. And there's a guideline on how to do that. And we're gonna go over lab on how to use an autoclave. In order to use the autoclave, my, uh, uh, my instruments that are sanctioned to be used in, a, in an autoclave for sterilization, 
we got to scrub them, make sure there's no uh, material on it. We let it soak in a neutral pH solution, typically like, you know, soapy water. And then after that, we let it soak in a disinfectant and or antiseptic and the list we were just discussed. And after that, we then we put it in uh, the autoclave and then we pressure, pressure heat it. We either do pressure heat and or both. Okay, so that's a nice both A and B question. And it's like a pressure cooker. And what, what will that do to uh, whatever remaining bacteria we have? It'll kill a lot of it. So when you sterilize something, it has a shelf life. So let's say I sterilized a set of scissors. Once I sterilize those scissors, I better use them in, in the next week or two, or there's gonna be bacteria and other things growing on it eventually. So if I see the packet, it hasn't been open in months, guess what, I can't use it. I have to use a packet that's been recently uh, autoclaved. Infection control, hygiene rules and regulations. Now, this has all changed because of COVID. Nowadays, every, we can't just use hand sanitizers. Everything you have to scrub in for each and every patient. And that's a clinical scrub. So it's only at the level of your wrists, okay? And we have to uh, clean all surfaces um, before and after the patient arrives. That was always true before, but now we really, really have to be diligent uh, about it. And instrument identification, I'm gonna show you in a minute as well. And um, well, when we get closer and closer to the surgical stuff, um, the surgical service, we're gonna keep on adding more instruments. So that's done. So let's look at some of the things that we just mentioned here in our notes slash outline. Okay. So before, hand hygiene was okay with using, um, uh, you know, a Purell or whatever if it was non-invasive. But nowadays we have to, we have to wash hands before and after, that's every patient. 10% bleach solution should be used for anything, uh, anything blood, okay? Here's the proper way to fold up the examination table. Uh, what you don't see here is the, uh, the clinician not touching any of these surfaces and rolling it away from their body, right? And all the dirty stuff is inside the roll and that's how you dispose of it. And you only dispose of it in the proper uh, place. So if it's biohazard material, you put it in the biohazard. Refrigerator control, you might see one of these things uh, at your doctor's office. There has to be, there's a, uh, there's a specific, and I don't think it's right to memorize it, you should be fine. Putting the room in order, you always clean before and after, right? Lighting, good ventilation, knowing what instruments uh, that the doctor would like to have. And here are the instruments, anoscope for any um, rectal examinations, an examination light, I'll show you how to position those, reflex hammer, laryngeal mirror, nasal speculum. Now, stuff like the laryngeal mirror and nasal speculum and anoscope, those things touch the inside of my, hum my human body, inside of my patient. Therefore, those need to be sterilized. Everything else like this, like the otoscope, the tips, they're disposable, right? But some, pay, uh, some doctors, they, they, they put it in the disinfectant. But nowadays, I think with the, the enhanced COVID protocols, I think uh, it's time to throw all of those out, right? And the otoscope handles and the ophthalmoscope handles. Otoscope is for the ears, ophthalmoscope is for the eyes. And I wish we had more time in lab. We used to play around with these in class. Of course, your sphygmomanometer, say that five times fast. That's your BP cuff. You're always looking to see if the, the cuff is clean, if there's any uh, debris or dirt from the previous patient. Again, you don't sterilize this. You don't, you don't necessarily sterilize the tuning fork because it doesn't touch anything. But definitely this, vag this duckbill vaginal speculum, you definitely have to sterilize. Tape measures, pen lights, the uh, thermometers, the thermometers have the covers. Make sure you dispose of the covers. If any schmutz or any uh, schmutz, <laughs> uh, 
uh, if any um, uh, mucosal material or uh, um, saliva or body fluids get on this thermometer, uh, you also have to disinfect that as well. Stethoscope, pen light, thermometer, tape measure, 70% isopropyl alcohol. Vaginal speculum, you have to sterilize that. So it has to go through the whole sterilization process. Okay, and here is the list of what gets sanitized, what gets disinfected, and what gets sterilized. Okay, and we don't pretty much use reusable needles and syringes anymore. Um, we don't use them as much because they're disposable ones. Okay. This is how to properly uh, prepare things for your physician. Do you see how everything has its place and it's separated? Okay. And uh, we'll be talking about asepsis. You can also see how it, none of it, this is a mayo tray and uh, we can also sterilize this top part. This top part is removable. Um, um, so that's also important. Another way we could sanitize is use an ultrasound cleaner. Uh, maybe you've seen them in your um, doctor's office. So that concludes the addendum, right? Uh, I think there's a thing in here on how to do blood, uh, how to deal with blood, because there are blood kits. Uh, and again, in laboratory, I could show you that as well, how to deal with the blood kit. You, like, you don't just take, um, uh, uh, you don't just take a towel and, or a paper towel and start mopping everything up because then you'll just be spreading the infection. Right, um, there's uh, this powder that's in the kit um, that will, um, um, hey, why don't I just show you? Let me see if this runs a good what they show you. Yada, yada, yada. Based on the PIDAC environmental cleaning best practices. However, your procedures may vary according to the tools. Blood or body fluid spill. Assemble the materials required for dealing with the spill prior to putting on gloves. Inspect the area. That's wrong. Glove up. Glove up everything, even when handling all that stuff the spill thoroughly for splatters or splashes. Restrict the activity around the spill until the area has been cleaned and disinfected. And, and also communicate to everybody, hey, don't go in the room. I gotta go deal with that. Okay, there's blood on the floor or there's, there's blood here. So that if they do walk in the room to get supply, uh, they, know, uh, they know where to avoid because not all places have one of these uh, uh, wet floor signs. And even if they did, people still ignore it completely dry. Put on gloves, and if there is a possibility of splashing, wear a gown and facial protection, such as a mask and eye protection or face shield. When cleaning, confine and contain the spill by covering the spill with absorbent material, such as paper towel or chem. Now, um, there's uh, in a blood kit, oh, here it is, biohazard spillage kit, right? See this? Let's look at this one. Oh, we'll look at this one in a second. But do you see there's powder? You're supposed to put powder off on all the, all the stuff. And others have this absorbent pads that you put all over it. Uh, but this is acceptable. But, uh, but again, um, these kits are better because they make, they make it, uh, whatever that the spill, whether it's vomit, urine, blood, they make it inert, meaning that you could like sweep it up spill powder wipe up the spill using disposable towels you see how you're this spreading is an it around step as and disinfectant will not be effective if applied directly to blood or body fluids see how you're spreading dispose it around dispose of the materials by placing them into a regular waste receptacle if the okay no do not right uh how many oh, of course comments have turned off do not Throw, like if it's blood soaked, do not throw it in your uh, normal garbage. You gotta uh, throw it in the uh, biohazard. So right there, I don't like that video. So let's look at this one. And the spill kit, glove up, right? Before you do anything, you glove up 
and uh, you do everything. Uh, you follow the kit. Uh, all these kits have the step-by-step -step, uh, instructions. Is this the same lady? Hmm. Interesting. And you could see it, it has its biohazard bag, right? So that's vomitous, right? It could be blood or, and you take this stuff, it's like this powder and then it soaks up all the material. And when you take that powder, go nuts. Like just totally, totally cover it. Build yourself a sandcastle while you're at it. And use it all. Then you wait the prescribed time, two minutes, five minutes, 10, 15, who knows. Uh, with every facility, it's different. Then you do what? Use their little pooper scoopers to deal with it. And you'll see it turns it into a paste. And then they have these wipes. Then we'll deal with whatever, uh, anything else that's, uh, that's left over. It's like a wipes or spray. And like I stated, you, after you even use the kit, I like taking the 10% um, uh, bleach solution. So 10% uh, bleach solution is one part bleach, nine parts um, water. And um, I just spray it over and then uh, wipe it down because 10% bleach is the universal. And you see the last thing to go was the, but me personally, I would keep my gloves on and uh, dispose of everything. And of course, there is on your OSHA form, there is a uh, disposal forms. You make sure those disposal forms get filled out. And I could show you what those are in class. Alrighty. Okay, that concludes today's lecture or addenda lecture. Have a good one. See you in class.